Hi, I'm Sebastian, and together with Lou, we're going to give you a small sum up of what you expect for the Brawl Quest to We're Practical while down at the Hydraulics Lab. There's a bit to it, so let's get started. Firstly, what is a weir? Well, weirs are hydraulic structures that are built across the streams or rivers to enable the storage of water. For a normal and conventional type of weir, it's a structure that is designed to raise the upstream water level while having a type of diversion channel or spillway to divert the flow from one flow state to another. One example of a spillway channel is the V-shaped weir. As shown, it has a V-shaped notch out of the weir and is used to disrupt and change the flow, of, uh, flow rate from one state to another. Examples of weirs with large flow rates are usually confined by dam spillways. At the bottom of the downstream side of the weir, High velocity kinetic energy of the flow can be dissipated with a dissipator structure to change the state of flow. Another type of weir that can be used for large flow rates are minimum energy loss weirs, or MEL weirs for short. MEL weirs are usually used in flat areas such as estuaries, rivers, or where there's a large increase in flow within a wide catchment area. MEL weirs are designed to ma uh, minimize the total head of the overflow upstream, thus is trying to produce zero upflux from upstream. For this practical video, we are going to look at the broad question weir. Broad question weirs are mainly used for medium flow. A broad question weir is a flat crested structure with a base crest length larger compared to the upstream head, over crest or thickness of the water over the top of the upstream part of the weir. The ratio of the length, uh, crest length is usually larger than double the size of the head over crest. So when the crest is large enough, the flow uh, from the upstream becomes parallel to the crest. Thus the pressure distribution above the crest becomes hydrostatic. A critical flow depth then can be observed over the top of the wheel. In real, in real world applications, Broad crested weirs can also be used to measure stream discharge. Knowing the height of the weir and the height of the upstream depth of a stream or river, this discharge can then be found. And fundamental, uh, fundamental principles or theories can then be used to find that. So now that we know some general facts of what a weir is and some real world applications, let's get into some general theory of the practical taking place. Uh, so, the of here is a structure of Cross or river or channel, like here, here is our wheel. And when this happens, the water or the flow is going to become critical above the weir crest, the D equal DC, and then downstream, we are going to have a super critical flow, D, way less than DC. While upstream of the wheel, the water depth, P1, will be greater than DC, the critical depth, and that is sub critical flow. So we have a transition from sub to super critical flow with almost no energy loss. In turn, we may apply the Bernoulli principle, which will tell us that the upstream total head equals the total height as a crest equal the downstream total head where I use the surface three for downstream one for upstream. If we replace this as a function of the specific energy, keeping in mind that the we height will be denoted Z naught, we are going to add Upstream specific energy 
It was a specific energy at the first class. That not. It was a downstream specific energy. So it's a bad elevation is the same upstream and downstream. If now we plot this graphically, as the specific energy versus what on that. Initially, our water that is here, on the corresponding specific energy, is right here. Once the flow pass through the crest, we are going to move along this red curve. On the right here of the crest, we are going to have DA for DC, and we are going to have the specific energy at the crest equals the minimum specific energy. And then as we move downstream of the crest, the flow is going to accelerate. We are going to go along the lower branch. And ideally, if we have no energy loss, we are going to have E1 equal to E3. But this time, the water depth downstream of the building will be equal to the super critical. That's the basic theory. Now, the second part of the experiment. We are going to control the downstream flow by progressively rising the water level downstream of the wave. When we do so, we are going to create a hydraulic jump downstream of the wheel. The other flow will be subcritical critical, supercritical, and of course, back to subcritical downstream of the hydrogen jump. But if we continue to close the gate, that is if we continue to increase the water level downstream of the way, at one stage, we are going to have a water level which is almost going to be horizontal and we will no longer have critical problems at the wave price. On this, we say that we drown the wave. That's it. All right, so now we're going to give you a guide on the setup of the apparatus. On the image shown, you can see all the key features of the wheel. D1 shows us that shows the is shown as subcritical, D2 is shown as critical, and D3 being supercritical. The length of the whole weir is 40 centimeters and is 65 millimeters tall or 6.5 centimeters. The width of the channel is 395 millimeters and the length of the whole channel is 2.5 meters. Next, let's look at how to calculate the discharge of the, uh, of the water flowing through the channel. So, first of all, close the valve of the bucket. Once the valve has been shut, wait until the lever with the uh, weight has risen. Add another weight and time how long it takes for the lever to rise back up again. Knowing the weight, uh, knowing the weight used and how long it took for the lever to rise, you can then figure out how uh, out the flow of the discharge. Next, let's look at the gate and turn the handle anti-clockwise to close the gate. Be careful not to close the gate too quickly as this could cause a quick backward surge. 
Next, let's look at the valve needed to increase the flow of the channel. Turn the valve anti-clockwise to increase flow and turn the valve clockwise to decrease flow. Be careful not to increase flow too much as this could cause the experiment to flood. Lastly, let's look at how to measure the water levels at points D1, D2, and D3 of the experiment. Let's say the floor of D1 and D3 are datum height. From the video, it shows how to measure D2. Firstly, measure the height of the weir. Then measure the height of the water above the weir. The water level of the uh, weir minus the water uh, the weir height will give you D2. A similar process is done for D1 and D3 across the whole channel. So within this experiment, there are three main objectives that we're trying to understand about the broad quested weir. Firstly, we're understanding the flow effects of the broad quested weir and how the weir changes from subcritical to supercritical. Secondly, we're understanding the flow principles involved when closing the gate uh, when the gate starts to close, for example, like what happens with hydraulic jumps. And thirdly, understanding the effects on the broadcast of wind when the flow rate increases or decreases. A full visual effect of this can be shown when adding red dye into the water. The upstream side, the flow is subcritical and is moving at a slow velocity. On the weir, the flow is critical. And lastly, on the downstream side, the flow is super critical and is moving at a high velocity. Next, let's look at what happens when closing the gate. As you can see from the video, closing the gate causes the downstream side to rise, causing a hydraulic jump and turning it to subcritical. As the hydraulic jump keeps on moving across the channel, it gets to a point where it fully drowns the weir and thus there will no longer be any critical flow. Lastly, let's look at what happens if you increase the flow or decrease the flow rate of the weir. As shown in the video, increasing the flow rate will increase your D1, your D2 and D3 values. If the downstream value of the D3 increases to a height larger than the gate opening, this will again cause a hydraulic jump and can also, again, drown the weir. So now that we've seen the experiment, let's look at some of the data that can be uh, collected and retrieved. The graph in the video here displays the free surface ele elevation of the experiment and is looking at the elevation heights of the water at the different points of the channel. The blue line is the bed elevation and the orange line is the free surface elevation. From this, you can figure out how the flow is traveling and where the water is sub and super critical. It can also be used to get an approximate location of DC. The next bar shows a specific energy diagram of the broad coast of weir experiment with varied ranges of flow rates or discharges used. It shows the relationship of dimensionless specific energy E over DC versus dimensionless flow depth D over DC. The rate crosses are different values of upstream flow rates for D1. The higher to the top right the rate crosses are, the larger the discharge is. The black dots show different values of D2 flow heights with different values of upstream flow rates. Lastly, the blue circles show different values of D3 downstream flow heights when the value of the upstream discharge or flow rate changes. Overall, by using different discharges and calculating the value of D1, D2, and D3, the graph will show similar layout to theoretical data of the specific energy diagram. There are some limitations though when it comes to getting similar data to theory. Reoccurring problems like friction loss and perfections of the equipment and experiment are some reasons why the data is not exactly the same as theory. However, by doing the experiment, we can overall get a good understanding of how it does apply to theory. From this video, you should be able to understand the general properties of a broad quested wheel. You should also be able to understand the general apparatus setup of the experiment and be able to understand some of the data that would be gathered while doing the experiment. 
Thank you for listening.